All right. Well, good afternoon, Grove family. How are we doing? It's good to see you. My name is Philip Bardos, and I serve here at the Grove, and we're so excited to have you here this afternoon with us and the Grove men. I know they're excited to serve as well. Uh, if uh, you're watching us online or in the courtyard or here in the worship center, we're excited that you're here. Uh, when you came in, you were handed a bulletin, and on the back of that bulletin is a Connect card. If this is your first time here, we'd ask that you take an opportunity and fill that out. You can drop it off in either one of the donation boxes when you leave, or if you'd like, you can take it over to Grass Central, and uh, we'd love to meet you and get to know you and answer any questions that you may have. We have Easter coming up. Who's excited about Easter? All right. Yeah, so with that... In the breezeways, when you leave, we have our yard signs and invite cards out there. Make sure you grab one and invite someone to Easter. Uh, also, with the new Easter services that are coming up, we've got a new service that we're going to be uh, implementing on Easter Sunday, right? So we still have our Saturday 4 o'clock, our 4 p.m. service. We have our 8 a.m. service on Sunday morning, our 9.30 uh, a.m. service on Sunday morning, and then at 11.15 we also have a sunrise service on the East Lawn, which is directly behind us here for you early birds. Um, and so with all of that being said with these new services, Daniel talked about it last week that we, uh, we need some volunteers, we need some help. I know he had put the, put the slide up there and I think we're gonna have one show up here. We had a lot of people step up and, and answer that call, but we, and we appreciate that, we still need some help. So if you are willing and able in the breezeways after service, Stop on by the booth and see what's available. You can see where you can fill in there. The numbers have gone down, but we still need some help, all right? And so uh, with that, it is a, a great pleasure that we get to serve with you this morning. Why don't we stand and get ready to worship, and we praise the Lord. Well, it's good for us to stand together and worship the Lord, amen. Would you welcome the guys as well? After 120 guys spending a week down in Belize just serving and being together, we thought it'd be great for us to just spend some time doing that with you as we worship all together as one. Amen? All right, so we're going to sing a song tonight. We're going to sing Battle Belongs to the Lord, Our Hearts, as we fight for Him. Here we go.
you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our
story. with all of you here tonight. Why don't you take just a moment, greet someone around you here at the Grove. Tell them you're glad to see them here. get my Bible. Hey, good evening. Was that fun or what? How you, what do you guys think of that men's choir? I'll tell you, what, one of my favorite weekends is when the men lead us in worship. I, I think we can make a bid on the Super Bowl halftime show. I mean, let's bring some light to that game. Light it up. So, uh, yeah, I do love uh, being with our guys, and I feel like one of the, the most luckiest guys in the world to be able to hang with our, our men here at the church. Uh, one of the things I do love about this hands trek, and specifically, is not just the choir as, when we come back, but being with them the week that we're there down in Belize, or in this case, Belize, or wherever we go. Hands has been in many places, and we're looking to shift gears in this next following year. But I'll tell you, be, spending a week with these guys is incredible. We have some amazing men here at the Grove, and this is just a sample of them. And so I, I tell you what, we are, I'm so thankful. I come back to, from a trip like this, so thankful for the men in our church. Can we just recognize we got some amazing men in our church. One of the things we did this year as we uh, were there in Belize, we made some friends, uh, as we always do with the locals. And uh, specifically this year, we made some friends with some guys who speak Creole. And the Creole language is very interesting because it's, you, sound, you can hear English in it. And as you're listening to people who are speaking Creole, it's a Caribbean language. As they're speaking their language, you, you hear this English and you feel like you can understand. But oftentimes it's tough to understand. It's a little confusing. So I'm going to read a passage of scripture, Creole, and see if you can figure it out. All right, so forgive my accent. I'm still learning. So no do nothing, Joe's to una can get you what you want. And no show off, he crave, make people think you know important are better than nobody. Why, you know, if he do humble, humble yourself, una self, and treat one another better than uh, you want to treat your una self, almost done, un una no fi look ut ungle fi un self one. But una fi care put una brother and sister them too. Hey. <laughs> Philippians, that is, if you guessed Philippians 2, 3, and 4, you were spot on. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read it in English, but I'm going to back up to verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 11. It says, so, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours, in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, God the Father, and somebody join me as we say amen. amen. You know, uh, what I want to do this uh, evening is look at this text. Um, we've, this is our third week looking at this particular passage, which I think is so fun because it is an incredible passage. And I'm so thankful to belong to a church that says, hey, let's spend three weeks studying the same passage because it's just so deep and rich. Uh, because it is. And as we come back from hands, we want to try to illustrate this passage with some of the things we learned. So I'm going to point out th- uh, a principle, which is this. Uh, if we uh, recognize Jesus as our faithful, humble king, if he is your faithful, humble king, if he is my faithful king, uh, humble king, if he is our faithful, humble king, then he is worthy of our faithful, humble service. He is worthy of our faithful, humble service. That's the thing I want to try to, I want to try to paint that big picture and break it down. We're going to look at three characteristics from this. And then I'm going to introduce a couple of guys who are going to come share. We're going to have a video. Then Joe's going to come share. I'm going to uh, have a final word of prayer at the end. So in regard to this, this point, this is an conditional statement. If Jesus is your faithful, humble king, then he is worthy of our faithful, humble service. This starts off in verse 1 and 2 where it's, it's challenging us if you have participated in Christ, if you have any encouragement in Christ, if you have benefited from him. In other words, if you have trusted in him, if you have called upon his name, if you have committed yourself to his name, if you have been forgiven by him, if you somehow find any courage or encouragement in Christ, then Paul says, make my joy complete. And as he goes on, he says, let the mind of Christ be in you. And so we've been spending some time really trying to figure out what this passage is saying. And it's been so good the last couple of, uh, of weeks. I want to just continue to take another, another uh, 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 round of looking at this. And I, I think that the idea here is that if we claim Christ as ours, then let's live like it. Let's let him impact. Let's serve him with faithfulness and humility. And so let's look at these, these, these words. The first one I want to look at is faithfulness. A faithful mindset. Last week we looked at this as a humble mindset and it's definitely a humble mindset. Also I want to look at this as a faithful mindset as we're learning to have a mind like Christ. Uh, In verse uh, verse 5 it tells us, I'm sorry, let me read again at verse 3. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count yourselves or others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of of others having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. You see, Christ was humble and Christ was faithful. Christ was faithfully humble and he was faithful to everything that was assigned to him. And as he lived his life here, as he conducted his life here, his character, and uh, and, uh, he was faithful. And in his assignment, what he was given to do, he was faithful. Uh, In fact, as we follow the ministry of Christ, he was faithful to the end. Uh, In the prayer, the great prayer in John 17, uh, where Jesus is praying, he says that he has come to the point where he has finished everything that the Father had given him to do. On the cross, he says, it is finished. Again, a a, a call to the recognizing that he had finished what God had, what the Father had assigned him to do. He is faithful to love us. He is faithful to teach us. He was faithful to the point of death, even death on the cross. He was faithful in his ministry Uh, in the way that he lived his life and led the disciples and began the church movement. It's all because Jesus was faithful. We have a faithful, it says in in Hebrews, a faithful high priest who was tempted in every way that you and I are. Jesus faced the temptation, but he was faithful. He was perfect. He was without sin. And so as we consider Jesus taking on his mindset, uh, we must aim at the same kind of mindset of being faithful as Jesus was, faithful to love people, faithful to love God, faithful to walk in a way that he walked. He is the target. His mindset, his mind frame, the way Jesus thought should be our target. 
There's a verse that says uh, that we are to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Why? Because Jesus is our target. We want to aim to learn to think like Christ and walk like Christ and be faithful like Christ. And, you know, my girls and I play this game on Game Pigeon. If you have an iPhone, you know what I mean. It's archery. And uh, we, we uh, you know, when I think of archery, I think of a target. And sometimes you nail it. Sometimes you miss it. Sometimes you get close. But Jesus is always going to be our target. And we aim our life at, our character at, our service at. We're to be same, the same mind that he had. Walk in his ways. And so, in other words, he's to be our hero. He's to lead us, shape us, and guide us. We want to walk in his ways. And how do we do that? We live in a world that invites us to be interested in a lot of other things. And these things invite us and we're distracted by all kinds of things in our world. And Jesus himself had to refocus. And he did this through two disciplines, prayer and devotion. Consistently in the life of Jesus, he got away and had some devotional time and some prayer time. And as we come back from our trip, I want to tell you, this was something that really impacted us. And our pursuit of faithfulness over our time in, in Belize was to introduce a time of devotion and a time of prayer. At 3.33 every day, we stopped and said, we need to refocus our day. No matter what we're doing, whatever project we're on, we're going to refocus at 3.33. And we're going to stop, we're going to pray and refocus our time on, on what God is doing as opposed to what we're doing. I want to refocus our interest. And why 333, people ask. Well, it comes from Jeremiah 33, 3, which God is inviting the people uh, to call upon him because he will show them great and unsearchable things uh, that they have not known. And so it's just an invitation that God gives us. And we thought, oh, let's take that verse address and make it a time of the day where we pray. And so uh, I, I was encouraged uh, a couple of days ago by one of the women of our church who had heard about this. She said she set her alarm at 333 every day. She prays for our church. And uh, I was blessed by that. I think it's good to set a pattern and a rhythm of prayer that interrupts our life that says, hey, come back. Refocus your time. Refocus your mind. Refocus your life, your interest on the mind of Christ. The things that God is concerned about. Uh, not only that, but one of the things I want to tell you about is our devotions. While we were there in, in Belize, we, we copied a chapter of the change book and put it in the devotions. And it was week six, enduring hardship and overcoming sin. And it was just a timely week to be with the guys away where we can go through this together. And uh, my heart was blessed as we debriefed our week at the end, at the end of the week. And man after man gave testimony of how impactful and important that devotional time was. Why? Because it refocused them. The devotional time refocused them and helped, helped them think about some things that God wanted them to think about. That God is calling them to think about. That's what devotion times, that's what prayer does. It calls us back to refocus our, our mindset uh, to be faithful on the, thing God, on the things God has called us to. The other word I want to I look at is humility. Humbleness. This is a huge theme throughout Philippians 2. In fact, our whole series right now is called Humble. Uh, we need to learn how to be humble. It doesn't really quite come naturally. And Jesus was perfect at it. Jesus was the only person who was perfect at being humble. It was a perfect display of humble love. I want to fill that in. His, his love was humble. The way he loved people wasn't self-love. He, he loved people truly for their, own, for, for their interest. And I think about in Philippians 2 where uh, we look at the humility of Christ in verse 8. That Jesus uh, had was found in human form and he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He had to humble himself. Why would he humble himself to obedience? What is, who is he being obedient to? Well, it's the Father's will that Jesus came and would surrender his life. It was part of the plan. It was the assignment. That's why Jesus came, was to offer his life as a sacrifice for our sin. That's what he did. And that was a battle for him at some point where he had to submit himself to the plan. And he humbled himself and his will to the obedience of the Father. And his obedience to the point of death, even death on a, on, in a most painful, suffering, agonizing way. And he did it. And he did it for us. He humbled himself in that way. Because that's what we needed. That's what we needed. There was no other way for us to be saved from our sin unless Jesus made the payment. And it says God demonstrated his love in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's humble love. That God would look after our interest in such a way. And as Jesus was doing this to fulfill the Father's plan, he's looking after the Father's interest as well. He does this all to the glory of the Father. It pleased the Father that Jesus would do this on our behalf. This is the Father's plan that Jesus was executing. So they're in it together. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. 
And so why is that important to us? Because I think what's at root of that is there, God was answering a question and, 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 and solving a, a problem. And the question is this, what did we need? We needed a savior. And God provided that with his humble love. And so I, I, all that to say, I think this, this humble love should cause us to ask a question. How do we serve people? How do we love people? How do we care for people? How can we invest into the interest of other people? Humble love is about asking a question. How can I serve you? And again, coming to hands, that's how every trip starts. When we go down there, regardless of where we go, we ask a question. How can we serve the local church? How can we serve the global partners? Any trek our church ever does, whether it's uh, to Belize or to uh, uh, China or to uh, Timbuktu, we start with a question, how can we serve? What can we do for you? It's a humble question. We want to do, we, wanna, we don't want to come with our agenda. We want to let you come up with the agenda and we're going to serve it. So that when we're gone, you're going to be able to, the, the, the global partners, whoever's able to carry on. And that's how we were able to do all the things we did in Belize, from building roofs to building houses to water projects to bathrooms and showers and playgrounds and on and off. We did so many things there in Belize. But it always started not with what we wanted to do, but asking the question, what they needed. And then the idea is that we would come home with that same question to our church. And ask, what does our church need? What does our families need? What do our, our spouses need? What do our kids need? And the idea is that we go on, uh, the idea is that we learn to ask a question. And I think that's motivated by the way Christ served us, as he served us. So we should humbly consider how we can love the people around us, us and love them, serve them uh, in, in the same manner, such as Christ did, looking not only to his own interest, but to the interest of others. We need to ask, what are their interests? And how can we prioritize that? And lastly, uh, I want to look at the, the word service. Uh, sacrificial, serv serving with sacrifice, service with sac sacrifice. I want to take a minute and just to, uh, look at this. Jesus, it says, uh, he, he became, took on the form of a human and became a servant in verse 7. He became a servant. Think about that. God became a man. The king became a servant. And he served us by giving his life for us. God had given him his son to die on a cross on our behalf. This is, for, this is what we needed. It was a service with sacrifice. And now it's our time. He served us and now it's our time to serve him. He's a faithful, humble king who is worthy of our faithful, humble service. And now it's our time to serve him with sacrifice. He served us with the greatest sacrifice. And now it's our time to serve him with any and every sacrifice we can make. Why? Because he's worthy and he deserves it. And so I think a trip like this is just an introductory. It's like a spiritual discipline. It's an opportunity to learn how to make a little sacrifice. Why? For the sake of other people. To faithfully and humbly go serve by making a little sacrifice. There is a cost. On this particular trek that we went, we, we left for a week. We were gone for a week. I actually went early. I was gone 11 days with a few others. There's a cost of time. There's the cost of money. There's a, a monetary uh, 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 cost. It, it cost money to go. You had to $1,200 for this trip. A week away. It cost uh, being away from family and friends. Many of our guys were sleeping on floors. Getting bit, we were bit by mosquitoes. I I'm, I'm still have some mosquito bites I'm, I'm scratching these days. Almost through it, but uh, it's still, still processed. That was part of the cost. One of, uh, the, one of the pastors uh, recognized that there's a judge on our team, a county judge who was sleeping on the floor of his church. And he was just mind-blowing. A judge from California in the United States is sleeping on the floor of my church? A judge the floor of my church. And it just couldn't get his head around the fact that somebody would be willing to come and humbly serve him and give up the comforts. I mean, in, in our minds, a judge has a lofty role, and here he took on the role of a servant. And we have many men in our church, and women I know in our church, who are willing to do that. Why? Because we serve a faithful, humble king who's worthy of our faithful, humble service. And it's amazing to belong to a church who gets that. And we're getting that more and more. Do we have it on target every point? No, we miss it every now and then. But that is the aim of our church. We want to be a faithful, humble church serving the needs around us. You know, Daniel put the pitch out last week. We are 
adding another service to our church. So as we come home, we're asking the the question, what does our church need? Well, we put the, the, the need out there. Our church needs volunteers. Our church needs volunteers in children's ministry, in the hub, in uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, hospitality services, the parking lot. Uh, you see the roster behind me. And we just need a little bit more help. There's two guys who have been given their mornings uh, and afternoons every Saturday and Sunday for years. Roy Peterson and Mike Schultz. And they, they are our brewmasters when it comes to the coffee. These guys are amazing. And we're just looking to add to the team. We're going to be rolling burritos on Sunday morning. We just need a team to help roll them up. And don't worry, you get paid by having, uh, if you roll them, you get two, all right? Um, (laughs) um, We we need help, and our church is is asking. And and so we just need people to rise up. And so we're asking for that, and I know our church will. Also, it's a question we need, again, to take home to our spouses, to our kids, to our neighborhoods, to our friends, our parents even. How can we serve? What do you need from me? What can I do for you? And we do that with an attitude of first loving God and loving people. And as we do, we will be serving our faithful, humble king in a way that is worthy. Uh, We want to do that, don't we, church? Well, let us continue to carry on in our our growth and our pursuit of serving uh, our faithful, humble king with faithful, humble attitudes and service. I got a couple of guys I want to introduce to you, some faithful, humble servants who I was impressed with over the, our time in hands. These guys are incredible. Uh, and I want to invite them to come share a little bit about their experience in Belize. Let's welcome John Burton and Jason Molinari. Well, thank you, uh, church. Uh, It was an incredible, incredible time. My first time in Belize. My name is Jonathan Burton, a.k.a. JB. The team gave me this. Team number nine, we were called the Bathroom Bombers. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But I thought it was more like the Bad News Bears, and I'll tell you why. Our team consisted of five old guys over the age of 60 and three or no, actually five uh, young men, we called them greenhorns, uh, under the age of 30, and none of which had any or very little experience about laying block. So you can imagine how that went. But I felt good about th- this group. It was like working with disciples and an apostle. This is a true story. My group's name was Peter, James, John, John, Doug, and Paul. How cool is that? <laughs> Our greenhorns were, they had names, Bible names as well. And the greenhorns were two Lukes. We had two Lukes, a Daniel, an Aaron, a Weston, and Hudson. Now, Weston and Hudson, they have to do a little bit more work on their Bible name, but we'll, we'll, we'll give them a pass on that. We had a job to do, and we set out to do it. One of the highlights was that we, see, we saw men who were willing to give up their life. They didn't know the trade, but they came with willing hearts. And they just said, show us how. Show me, and we would get it done. That's right. They said, show us, and we'd get it done. Two of the highlights were, the second highlight was when we would gather around and have our devotional. They trained, they told me that it's no longer devotional, it's Devo. So we have to do Devo time, not devotional time. That's the young guys for us. So we sat around the tables and we discussed, and I really realized very soon, very quickly, how the men that were at that table were hurting men too. And yet they took their time and they exemplified Philippians 2, 3 through 4 that says, that let nothing be done with selfish ambitions and conceit, but in lowliness of mind, and let each esteem others better than themselves. And let each look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And the amazing thing was to see young men on fire for Jesus. I mean, these guys came out, they were not whining, they were not complaining, but they were out to get a job done, and they did. And finally, my third highlight was a time I was able to spend time with God in the mouth of a cave in Blue Creek. 
I was sitting on a rock and listening to the sounds of the running water. And I was able to receive my healing because not too long ago, a couple of months ago, I lost my oldest son. And I knew that there, this heart that I felt, there was other men that was there that was hurting too. And yet we put in the work and we devoted our time for not only each other, but for the work of the Lord. And Pastor Daniel said last week in his message that he said, holiness is seen in humility. And I was a witness last week that 120 men, the most humble men that I've ever seen, was able to share time and work together. And I was so glad to be a part of that trek. God bless you. Thank you. Come on, brother. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, kind of like Pastor Trevor said, and, and Jonathan just alluded to this trip, uh, it was amazing. Uh, I've been at the Grove for six years. This was my first hands trek. Uh, it was my first mission trip for that matter. Uh, you know, I think I'd always had reasons not to go. I think, you know, I would convince myself that I was too busy or I couldn't take a week. Um, you know, or for hands specifically that uh, I didn't really have the skill set that they needed to be useful. Uh, I don't really have a construction background. I think I can work a screw gun and, and that's probably the only thing I've going for me. Um, but one of the things that I learned when I went to this was that you have a ton of people there that really are, are incredibly smart in this stuff. They're really skilled and they really want to teach you uh, how to do it. And so, you know, immediately uh, you find that you're useful. Um, so that, I think that part was really good. Um, you know, uh, going there in, in Belize, I was on a team of, of 12 guys. And we were on team one. It was led by Adam McIntyre and uh, Leo Heitman. Um, our job was to build a house. It was to build a house for a family of nine people. So nine people, when we got there, were living in this little shack. You can see it on the right in the picture. Uh, it's a little shack that um, was falling down around them, literally. Uh, it had dirt floors. Um, it was just, it was in really rough shape. Uh, so we got out there and... Uh, Adam McIntyre actually designed that house you see on the left, um, but we, uh, we went to work and we built this thing, and it was just an amazing opportunity, and one of the things I think that stands out most to me uh, was that there was just pure joy and gratitude in this family. Uh, the mom, when she spoke, and the way that she gave glory to God uh, just was something that I, I don't think I'll ever forget. Uh, it was just really cool to be part of that, and so, you know, I think, and I've said this, and you guys might have heard other people say this that have gone on these treks. It's hard to tell who's blessed more, us by being able to go or, or the people that were there to serve. Uh, so, you know, apart from that, uh, just kind of like both these guys alluded to as well, it, it was the fellowship. It was the uh, being surrounded by a bunch of men who genuinely love the Lord and who uh, would sit around every morning. For us, it was 630. We would do our devotion before we'd go out and uh, just talk openly and, and honestly about, you know, our journey and our faith and our testimony and and. I thought that part was just something that you, you know, you can't duplicate, I don't think, anywhere else. And so that was a huge part of it. Um, you know, I, I, I think for me, the, the last thing that uh, you see, there's a picture um, that we took. So we finished this house on Thursday night, and we turned the keys over, and uh, we gave it to the family. There was a little ceremony, and, and it was just a really cool thing. But Friday morning, we went back by the house, and... We went by to say goodbye, and as we get out of the van, uh, Adam Walker, who's in our group, asked us if we had uh, noticed before that there were a bunch of flowers on the bush out front, and um, I hadn't, uh, but I did have pictures, and so I went back through my pictures, and I looked, and the day before, I took a picture in the same spot, and you can see that that bush was bare. Uh, there was nothing on it, and then we go back the next morning, and it was just loaded with flowers, and I thought that was really cool. And you know, my heart, I uh, just thought, you know, God was pleased, and it was just cool to be part of that. Um, so all that said, uh, this church is amazing. It's got phenomenal leadership. Um, it, you know, it really does uh, get out there and, and is, is out there helping people, not just here, but, but everywhere else. Uh, so, you know, that's just one of the things that I, I take away from this as well. Uh, it's a church that's truly being changed by God to reach all people. So thanks for letting me share. You've heard from a couple of our guys the impact of hands on them. Now let's watch a video and see the impact of hands on Belize.
We've been here eight years and many of us were wondering what we were gonna do. And when we found Belize, we found this camp. I'm standing in it right now. It's Machaca Camp with John and Lisa Gotts. And when I introduced myself to them, I asked them if they could handle 100 guys and, and they said, yes, absolutely. I think for me, I was ecstatic because it was an answer to prayer. Because believe being, Belize being so-called the fatherless nation, right? You have homes, you have 75% of the homes that don't have a father. And here's a team of a hundred, I've always called them the mighty men, the mighty men of God. So we have a hundred mighty men of God, whether they're fathers, sons, brothers, uh, coming in to display what it looks like to be a godly man. When Lisa and I, when we felt that God said, hey, I don't want you to leave Belize back 2017. We didn't pray for money. We didn't pray for the property. We didn't pray. We prayed that God would surround us and bring us people of excellence. We wanted to change the status quo of missions. And so the men of the Grove answered the call. Yeah, well, I think that every time that you guys come here, the community is happy because first of all, you guys come here and help our people. And I think that when you help a family, not only that family is, is, is happy, you know, the other families are wrong, they're happy for that family. You know, it's, it's like a community happiness then. So you're not only impacting the family who is getting the benefit, you're also impacting the people around them, you understand? Yeah. So sometimes you would feel like only this family is getting benefit, but in reality, the whole community is being benefited. Because we, I believe in, in this, especially in the village, we feel like everybody's a family member, right? So when somebody gets the help, then you know everybody's happy for that person. You know, and people are looking at this from you know the perspective of you know what saying God is doing it, not not hands takes the glory, not the growth takes the glory, but God takes the glory. You know, what I'm saying. While building structures and homes and water collection projects has always been important. The priority has been building relationships. We want to work together to bring people to Jesus. I believe God's doing a great work here in Independence. 
Our vision is to be changed by God to reach all people. That's, that's what brings us to Belize. We want to be changed by God to reach all people. And you know what else we did? The biggest thing is that God did construction in the hearts of the men that come every year. It has been amazing to see the construction that God has done in these men as they seek to be better husbands, as they seek to be better fathers, as they seek to be better employees or employers. But you know what? God has a purpose for you today. Sometimes you may go to your jobs and things are not working out the way you wanted to work. But just give it a chance and let God work in your life. Because you know what's going to happen when you go back. Your life is going to be transformed. The projects are cool. But projects, like anything, are going to go away. If we look at it that way of all the different projects, the impact of every project is the relationship, not the project. It's truly been a blessing to see how the local governments and local churches have taken on the mantle of what we've brought down as they spread that joy, that love, that building throughout their communities. I believe that you guys have started something within us, first of all, within our hearts, to you know, say, you know what, I'm not gonna wait until somebody comes from another country to start helping my people. I think you guys have really touched the um, key people within this country, pastors, leaders. And these same leaders, uh, I will include myself, we are saying, hey, it's time to help our people. Yes, we are grateful for hands and coming here to help us, but you initiated something within us. Hey, let's help our own people. I feel like the, the, the eight years that you've done here has been this beautiful birthing process. So not only have you given an example and mentoring and, and what a father looks like, what a father-son relationship looks like, what it looks like to be a mighty man of God, not only have you modeled that, but I feel like the last eight years have set up a birthing of what you've done that now the, the, the men of Belize are going to step into that. And so that's what I feel like eight years uh, it's a new season, but I feel like it's calling forth the men of Belize. The Hand's legacy has never deviated from its original goal, to follow Jesus and to make him known, to be changed by God to reach all people. We thank God for all the time that he blessed us with in the country of Belize. And we cannot wait to see what happens in the next chapter. Pretty powerful video, isn't it? Amen. Amen. 120 men went on hands this year. Isn't that incredible? Yes. Let's, th let's thank the Lord for that. 120 men. But I'll tell you, I was so glad to get them back to you guys, to the wives and families. When you get 120 guys together, somehow their IQ gets lower. And they start acting like 12-year-olds. <laughs> and I have to repeat myself over and over again. I'm so glad they're back home. <laughs> so these, these men were incredible. These men did an amazing job. These men of the Grove Community Church. Because it all starts here with the church. Before it can get into the world. And you know, one of the things that, that we've learned is these guys that went on this trip, and some of you guys have gone in the past, and what uh, Trevor had shared, you sa these men sacrificed a lot. Some of them uh, took a week off without pay. We have some of these guys that left their families, that didn't want to leave their families, and they paid money, as, as Trevor said. And they got up at 2 a.m. to, to make the airplane and leave 
It was hot there. They slept on the floor. They battled bugs, snakes, and bats. And they're still itching to this day. Their souvenir from Belize. But I'll tell you what happened. God showed up. God showed up. Because these men got humbled. And they became servants. And they were full of love. And God showed up. In 2 Timothy 2.2, it says this. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see, it has always been in the hands leadership that what we wanted to do was not just go and do all these projects and come back and say, church, we did all those projects. It was more than that. It was our goal in Belize is that we would partner with local churches and year after year we begin to get to know more pastors, local pastors and communities and we were able to work alongside of them. And every project that we did was because of those local churches and what they wanted because we had to leave and those churches stayed to care for every family and every community member once we left they had to take care of. It is the local church's responsibility. It isn't for us to just feel good and build, do all these projects and just come home. God has called the church to reach their communities and their neighbors, their country, and the world. And each year we have started to expand that at Machaca Camp, and then we just grew out of that. And from that, we got to know people like Pastor Brian or Pastor Alvin and others. They begin to work with us. And what we begin to see is this, is that they got to watch us do things in their communities. Then they did it alongside of us. And then we get to watch them do it. And then we're asking the church in Belize to find somebody else to do it with. Amen. We have developed very close relationships with them then why should we leave Belize after eight years? Why should we leave Belize after eight years? When we have established all these great relationships, it's because the hands has not taken personal responsibility to reach Belize. But what we have done with those local pastors is to show them how to do it. And now they can do it. And one of the most exciting things as we were leaving, Trevor and I, we're very sad that we're, we made all these relationships but we're walking away. But this is what they said. These young pastors said, we're going to start a men's ministry at our church. They said, we're going to start a hands. And we're going to start reaching our own community. We don't need these folks in America. It is our responsibility to reach them. And hopes that they'll go to the world. You see, these pastors got it. They understand it. I can go to my boss. I could go to Pastor Daniel and say, we've accomplished our mission. They're going to do it now. There's so many other ministries that go and, and serve in other places that they are, the, they are the entity or the group that makes it all work. And if they were to walk away, it would just crumble. That is not how you do it. That is not how the Grove does it. And I'm very proud of the men of Hans because they're going to be missing some of these close people that they've gotten to know. And when I think, I get sad. But I also think that the Apostle Paul was sad too as he went on in his ministry from church after church. Our responsibility is the church and the second responsibility is to the world. And I want to tell you guys that there are, there are ways that you could be a part. It's not just hands, but we have treks happening throughout the year. Every year we have a number of treks that you can be involved in. Not only is the Grove an amazing church to be involved in, but God has also called us into the world. And how we can do it is go on one of these treks. 
In fact, right on the slide there is a QR code. And if you want to know more about a trek where you could take a week or two weeks out of your time and visit some of our global partners around the world, I would challenge you to do that. But as we've been saying, Pastor Daniel's been saying over the weeks, Trevor has just said it right now, that we need to be humble. We need to be servants. And we need to love. And take sacrifice to do those things. And I want to challenge you, and I know that Pastor Daniel wants this of our church, that at least go on one trek. At least go on one. Go see what God is doing in other parts of the world. That there are 3.1 billion people that have never heard the gospel. I'm going to ask the men that went on this year's trek to come forward and stand around here. And I want to kind of close uh, with sharing with you just a couple of things here. You know, we do this hand service every year. And every year we, we, we ponder and we think, should we keep doing this hand trip? But I'll tell you, there's something about having over 100 guys on stage, isn't it? Amen. Seeing 100 guys on stage singing. Seeing 100 guys' lives that have been transformed, it does something to you, doesn't it? In fact, I've heard from some that it's one of their favorite services of the year. And I've also heard that there have been a few that even have come to know Jesus as a result of this service. Because of what you see. It's just not in one sermon, but what you're hearing is the lives of these men and what they did. And their sacrifice and commitment. And, but maybe God is doing something in your heart right now. Maybe there's something being triggered within you. Or maybe it's just your wife elbowing you that you should go on this trip. <laughs> I want to tell you that some of these guys had the same experience this last year. And they went on this trip. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is talking to us. But sometimes it takes our wives to say, hey, listen up. Maybe you should consider going on hands. Maybe this is the year to sign up. Maybe. And I'm going to have, there's going to be a song that's going to be played soon. And then during that song, you may want to say, hey, you know what? I, I, I think I want to go. Maybe I'm gonna, I want to go and talk to one of these guys standing here. And I want to pray with them. Because some of you guys have been at the service year after year saying that you want to go, but a year is a pretty long time. And then you make up an excuse and you can't go. But maybe you need to come up here and ask one of these guys to hold you accountable. But maybe God is also tugging at your heart right here, men and women, that you want what these guys got on hands in Belize, but you could have it right now. Maybe God is starting to do construction in your heart, and you have never given your heart to Jesus. And maybe now's the time. And when they get up to worship and sing, maybe you need to go up there and go to one of these guys. And they can point you right to Jesus and pray with you. Maybe this is the moment. I hope you take it. Hands isn't about beliefs. Hands is also about us. You guys allowed us to go. I want you to be a part of this amazing church called the Grove Community Church because we're doing some amazing things. But God is doing some amazing things in the world. And you can be a part of both. But God's got to do some construction. Will you allow that? Let me pray for us before we sing. Father, thank you so much that have taken... 120 guys from all walks of life. Guys that are looking for a job to guys that are in the corporate world. 
And yet our hearts are the same, that we need Jesus. And what we witnessed here today was that very thing, 120 men that want to live a life transformed. They want to be changed by God so they can reach their neighbors, their family, their community, their state, their country, and the world. Father, my prayer is that everyone here wants that too. And we have 120 guys with transformed lives that would love to talk with you and pray with you. Lord, thank you. We thank you for the tithes and offerings that, that this church so generously gives every week that allows us to do things like this. I'm so grateful to be a part of this church and be a part of your family. Give us courage to stand up and walk over and talk to one of these men because there may even be a wife and a family member that wish that their husband or their father would be on this trip. Maybe they need to come up too and say, I need prayer for my husband or my brother. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
to be able to pray for you if necessary. If you've made any sort of decision today, man, they would love to talk to you about it. They're just here to be able to, to pray and, and speak with you about anything, ask them questions about their bug bites. I don't know, it'd be fine. Just come up and, and say hi. God bless you. Have a great rest tonight. If you're new with us, right over here to Guest Central, we'd love to say hi to you as well. God bless you.